going. Hare Krishna, everybody. And uh, we are on a uh, new topic. And I was really, I said I would read about uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I wanted to get something that was educational, inspirational, light. Uh, this afternoon, I'd sort of settled on Bhakti Ratnakar, which, but it's very long, although there are actually individual pastimes in there. And it's, uh, it's nice reading and getting to know about Shamananda Prabhu and uh, Srinivasacharya mostly. Uh, but because the book was so long, I thought I came across this, which I thought devotees would enjoy, and it fulfills all the qualifications. Swamiji, this is Brahmananda Maharaj's remembrances of Srila Prabhupada, and they're all just, well, they're, uh, yeah individual incidents, uh, stories, and so on. Uh, I first uh, met Brahmananda in 1975 when he was Srila Prabhupada's secretary. And Srila Prabhupada was in Montreal. I mean, told that pastime before, described it, when Prabhupada was just there for morning till afternoon. <laughs> we really felt, we felt very blissful, but we felt changed up. Prabhupada was going to be there for a week. Prabhupada hadn't been in Montreal since 1968. So now uh, he was going to be there and stay for a whole week. And uh, so, I mean, how much did I get to know, you know, Brahmananda Maharaj, who was uh, going around and serving Srila Prabhupada. But uh, next time I met him was in 19, uh, 1983 or 82, when he came to the UK. And that was when Jai Tirtha Prabhu separated from Iskon and Bhagwan became the GBC. And uh, he asked him to stay so that there was like a anchor there for, uh, and he stayed for a year. I was, uh, I was the president of Chaitanya College. I was president of Chaitanya College. I was the Sankatan leader as well. And then it was one Sankatan for the whole country. And uh, he was living at Chaitanya College, so we got to know each other very well. And uh, and then I would see him on and off when I'd go to Brindavan because he sort of retired, retired in Brindavan. And uh, he is, uh, he, is uh, he was actually a wrestler. You can come in over here, although I guess you could sit on the chair back there. <coughs> there was, uh, we ordered some more, but uh, they didn't arrive yet. You sit on the chair, or I guess you could sit on the chatter also. And uh, see, that was that was the right thing to do. Uh, he may want to sit on the floor because I think, well, why should I sit on the chair? I'm same height, but I told him sit on the chair. So instead of doing what he thinks, he does what I ask him to do. 
only about 5% of devotees do that, at least on the first, first instruction. And uh, yeah, he was, well, he, uh, he was into wrestling, put it that way. He wasn't a wrestler. He was a very soft-hearted person. And uh, he's a fantastic storyteller. And he gave, gave very wonderful, wonderful classes. And uh, Srila Prabhupada really, uh, really loved him very, very much. And uh, so, and he really loved uh, Prabhupada. It's, it's sort of a, uh, yeah. It's something that uh, maybe some disciples of Prabhupada's uh, disciples experience, but uh, we, li we would like all devotees to experience the same thing with Srila Prabhupada, that, uh, you know, when we, uh, when we first, when we came to Iskand, we didn't, uh, there was no working outside, living outside. There were no uh, salary devotees. There's no uh, there's no pension. There's no uh, what's it called when you retire? Uh, anyway, uh, there's there's only just one thing. You just you just give your life to Prabhupada. And you're not going to fall asleep because you're looking a little sleepy. And uh, it was like all or nothing. And that was, uh, you know, that was the commitment that we were making uh, when we were uh, joining. There was no university, there was no school, there was no. Uh, no, any other thing. It was just spreading Prabhupada's mission, and that was uh, that was all there was. Uh, the sort of social uh, development around this gone uh, necessary. Uh, it also provides all kinds of alternatives, and. Uh, and that alternative also gives an alternative to that type of uh, commitment. Uh, and I just mentioned that commitment just because it, it required so much of a attachment to Prabhupada and uh, maybe some devotees, Artha Jignasur, Artha Tigyanisha, maybe some devotees were really Gyanis and they knew, you know, they understood what Krishna was and what God was and so on. But uh, probably, again, the great majority of devotees, it was just Prabhupada. They may have never met Prabhupada, but Prabhupada was so, uh, so central uh, as, you know, spiritual master, as the founder of his God, as the person, you know, whatever, whatever he said, you do. And... Uh, so it required a, a real attachment uh, in order to be able to facilitate that. And that's what, uh, that's what my experience in sort of seeing Srila Prabhupada's disciples was that uh, in, uh, there were different generations there was the first wave, Brahmananda Maharaj, Satsvarup Maharaj, Jadwarani, uh, and quite a few devotees who are n no longer present, but uh, uh, of course Mukunda Maharaj, who was really the first. And uh, you know, I have, I don't know if I have his book here, or if it's here. It's, it's in Chandra. Yeah. And, uh, 
And then there was sort of a second wave, and these devotees were everything. Kirtan Dhamaraj, uh, Srila Prabhupada taught them everything personally. And uh, they, they, were, they were living with Prabhupada. Then, uh, then there was sort of the next generation who also had a lot of association with Prabhupada, but now it wasn't just in uh, New York City, but and San Francisco. It was there were also uh, devotees who uh, f uh, fit into that category, but they started in different parts of the world. But Prabhupada. I knew them when Prabhupada uh, traveled. And then sort of I'm in the third wave, uh, and that was with a lot of devotees whose association was minimal to even none. And then there was another one came around 75. And then the last wave was those who got first initiation from Srila Prabhupada, but then they uh, Prabhupada left the world. And, uh, and my understanding was that as close as you got in those waves, as close as you got to Srila Prabhupada uh, was due to your devotional activities in your past life. And uh, it's not you know, it, it wasn't just by mistake or just because you were in the right place at the right time uh, that uh, you got to uh, live and, you know, breathe with uh, a Krishna's eternal associate. It's, you're not going to go to sleep, are you? Acknowledgement. I'm grateful for the counterculture of the 1960s, without which there might be no Brahmananda. I was just looking who wrote this, but I'm not quite sure. Maybe we'll find out. I am uh, particularly grateful for the open-mindedness and overall freedom tenor of the hippie era. Indeed, while there was undeniably a downside to certain particulars of this much documented generation, those who were fortunate enough to come upon a pure devotee, Srila Prabhupada, filtering their new realizations through his spiritual vision and transcendental lifestyle, encountered a sublime result. They experienced the entire time period as a facilitator of sorts, enabling them to embrace an alternate way of being and a polydimensional view of <coughs> reality. I'm trying to figure out. I'm very, uh, I'm trying to find out who wrote this. It's not, uh, not, uh, not stated who wrote it. Uh, then there's a forward. And who is the forward by? It's a long forward. Thomas Hopkins. And then there's an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and who's the introduction by? I want to just get into. These are very. Nice bite size, uh, maybe. Mm. 
maybe I'll come back to it. I want to, since I already gave enough of an in, introduction, I want to just read from him. It was beginnings. It was November 1977. Prabhupada was lying ill in Brindavan, preparing to leave his party. Devotees were holding vigil night and day, singing the holy name for their guru's pleasure. Brahmananda, who at that time was a young man of 34 years, was also not well, perhaps the result of the stress born of Prabhupada's imminent demise or because of one of the many illnesses that Westerners typically contacted while visiting India. And for a few days, he did not leave his room. Finally, he emerged to see Prabhupada taking his place at his master's bedside. Brahmananda, Prabhupada whispered, his ability to speak with a strong voice compromised by his condition. Hearing his name, dutiful Brahmananda gingerly approached Prabhupada. Yes, Srila Prabhupada, you are not well, Prabhupada asked. Are you ill? Brahmananda was deeply moved. This is he writing. He's just writing in the uh, second person. Yeah, third. Third. Je te... Brahmananda was deeply moved. Prabhupada was on his deathbed, his body shriveled from disease, but his concern was for Brahmananda, for his disciple, for his movement. Prabhupada's love transcended his physical condition a truth that was epitomized in the simple expression of concern for Brahmananda, who wept as he sat before his dying guru. I saw him cry a lot of times when he was talking about Prabhupada. How did this come to be? Why was this exchange of love so strong, so pronounced? As Brahmananda looked into the deep brown eyes of the teacher he loved so much, he thought about his own long journey from New York to Brindavan and how it all began. Early days. Brahmananda initially appeared in this world as Bruce Sharp, Sharf on Wednesday, July 14, 1943. His father, Irvin, was an immigrant from Austria, a Polish Jew, whose father, Bruce's grandfather, Michael, invented the umbrella tip tipping machine. <laughs> What's an umbrella tipping machine? Although seemingly inconsequential, this machine, which appended little plastic strips, oh, it puts the tips on the umbrella automatically appended plastic strips on the end of the umbrella so that bearers don't poke themselves, brought the family considerable wealth. <laughs> Very creative. Think of that. When Irvin was in his early 20s, he came to the United States with his wife, Kay. She was a Russian Orthodox girl from the Ukraine, but converted to Judaism when they married. He initially employed her as a secretary and she continued to fill this position even as their life together unfolded. As a result of the inherited business, the couple relocated to New York and lived a privileged existence with a luxurious apartment just uptown from George Washington Bridge near 190th Street. Soon Bruce was born and gradually Irwin and Kay had two other children, Gregory and Cynthia. At the time of Bruce's birth, World War II was a fact of life, and it persisted for another couple of years, ending in 1945, with repercussions that would impact his childhood. 
still life was on an upswing in New York, especially for the wealthy. The Golden Globe Awards emerged in 1943 with huge films like Lassie Come Home and The Titanic, becoming the talk of the town. That's another Titanic. Frank Sinatra and other popular singers gave people hope with jazz-inflected show tunes, and Glenn Miller's big band sound made anything seem possible. Upscale restaurants and nightclubs were doing well, and with the creation of 17 million new jobs, the economy was slowly rising out of the Depression. Nonetheless, the ugliness of war loomed in the background, sparking deep-rooted fears and a sense of uneasiness amongst people in general. Irwin's business had to change with the times, and so he moved on from the umbrella tipping industry. Manufacturers throughout America started to produce war machines in addition to their standard goods. Best business. Companies like General Motors, for example, began making bombs and aircraft engines, as well as cars. In a similar spirit, Bruce's father wanted to help the war effort and consequently became involved with the Red Cross, even while his business moved into packaging concerns. Bruce recalls that time in his life. He's quoting himself. My father used to take care of the veterans when they came back wounded. He was assigned to the paraplegics. He would drive buses and take them wherever they needed to go. I remember they had wheelchair basketball games. As a kid, I would go see them play basketball in wheelchairs. It was inspiring, but also sad. They would have parties for their entertainment too, and my father would take care of them. You know, it was a shock as a young child to see people with no legs, but he would do the needful, helping out in this way. He was a humanitarian in that respect. In addition, he developed another business, packaging acetate plastic blocks. He made the packaging for Old Spice, among other things. Old Spice is uh, uh, perfume, perfume, men's, men's uh, perfume, shaving kits, and so on. Every Christmas, I would buy my father an Old Spice kit. And he would say, that was just what I needed. <laughs> Irwin worked for the largest independent packaging concern in America, Old Spice, which mainly manufactured grooming products for men, such as shaving cream, cologne, and aftershave lotion, originally came in gift sets as a cardboard box with a fancy wood veneer. The design on the individual white or cream-colored bottles became famous. A ship floated in between the words Old and Spice written in red scripts. By the 1940s, Old Spice was selling millions of bottles on a regular basis, and the Sharps were among those benefiting from it. Soon the family moved to Port Chester in upstate New York, where Bruce attended Parkland Elementary School for a time, and then King Street Elementary. He went on to Port Chester Junior High, and then the family again relocated to Stamford, Connecticut, at which time Bruce attended King School and Stamford High. At this time, he became something of an athlete, ex excelling in football and wrestling in particular. Says Bruce, football and wrestling were my games, and I did some track, mainly the contact sports. The coach loved me. I was his boy and I submitted to whatever he said. In fact, I was spotted by the Naval Academy for wrestling. They wanted me. But then I endured a neck injury, and that was all finished. From being on the top, a hero, I came crashing down. Before that, I didn't even have to make an effort in class. The teachers would give me good grades because I was the star athlete. That's America. 
Anyway, the whole hero thing collapsed and everyone forgot about me. That same coach, his name was Frank Bertino, who treated me like I was so special, eventually wanted nothing to do with me. Years later, when I was in college at NYU, New York University, I took a writing course and the assignment was to go back to a previous place, do some research and to write about it. So I went back to my preparatory school, Riverdale, and I went with my, and I met with my old coach. He didn't even recognize me. He didn't know who I was, and I had given my life to him. I had sacrificed my own personal well-being, and he didn't even recognize me. Of books and beatniks, subheading. While in Connecticut, the family purchased their new home from the then president of General Electric, Ralph J. Cordiner, a friend of Irwin's. The house was fully equipped with General Electric's most cutting-edge devices, as well as a private lake, a pool, and a tennis court. In these early years, Bruce led a largely uneventful, if charmed, life. His future interest in Eastern mysticism and spirituality still dormant. He did, however, already have an abiding interest in books, leading him to cherish intellectual traditions of various kinds. This increased throughout his high school years. Philosophy, poetry, and history became central interests, and he was also becoming aware of jazz, enjoying, for instance, the piano music of Dave Brubeck and the modern jazz quartet as well as its surrounding bohemian culture. This was the late 1950s and would continue into the early 1960s and as if pre-programmed to accommodate the leanings of his generation, he found himself thoroughly ensconced in the beatnik zeitgeist. What zeitgeist means? It's, a, it's the time of the time. His motto at this time was better to be different than indifferent. He began reading the beat poets, especially people like Gary Snyder, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Gregory Corso, and of course Allen Ginsberg, whom he specifically admired. Quote, I especially came to appreciate Ginsberg for Howell, says Bruce. It became an anthem for the alternate-minded at college, especially there in New York. I remember reading in Time magazine of his journey to India and attending Kumbh Mela. This really appealed to me." End quote. Bruce responded to the beats on many levels, particularly the dissatisfaction with mainstream politics and culture. He loved their unabashed enthusiasm to speak out against the hypocrisy and shallowness of more pedestrian concerns. He found himself studying Kenneth Patchen, especially, who was a luminary in the beat tradition. Patchen received praise even by more mainstream poets and the general literati of his day. This had a tremendous influence on Bruce and his friends. In time, Bruce took a creative writing course hoping to emulate his heroes among the beats. It was a time of protest and poetry seemed a good way to express one's disapproval. One's desire to be heard above the deafening silence of mediocrity. Among similar lines, he had read William H. White's The Organization Man, a best-selling book ostensibly about the particulars of management. But the book was much deeper than that is explained that Americans in general usually succumb to groupthink as opposed to cultivating their own individualistic thoughts and ideas. The book argued that people tended to lean towards organizations or had faith in the decisions fostered by a collective rather than assert their individuality or make decisions on their own. Bruce and his peers found this abhorrent. 
They valued personal creativity and individualism above all else. Good books in general became a haven from the world around him. As he recalls, I sought refuge in literature. Surely the great writers of the world shared my existential dilemma and found the answers through their life experiences and their writings. I inhabited my hometown's public library almost habitually. I read three books a week. You name it, I read it. For a while, my Bible was Sartre's uh, aptly titled Nausea. In college, I studied British, American, and French literature. After studying for four years, I concluded that these great authors adeptly portrayed the predicament but failed to offer the solution. And anyone who claimed to have the answer was relegated as an ideologue, a prosaic theorist. So there I was, waiting for Godot, wandering in the wasteland, a forlorn Ulysses. And my professors, whom I came to know personally, all seemed as unhappy as I was. No answers there. Of that, I was certain. But this was in college. Now we're back to the, back to writing, back to the third person. While still in high school, just prior to this, he had already suffered rude awakenings on numerous levels. There was upheaval in the family, for example. Well, it's sort of a common Phenomena. He's he was like when was he born? Forty three, so he was six years older than I, but still we were more or less the uh, same generation. And uh, his time, very interesting, was just leading up to the uh, hippie generation. Bruce's parents, Bruce's parents were getting a divorce and it affected him in a big way. In fact, he was, by this time, becoming divorced from his family as well. First person, I'll just say it like that. First person, third person. First person is when he's talking himself. Third person is when he's talking of Brahmananda as in third person. When my parents separated, it was a terrible shock though not entirely unexpected. My father was abusive, and I remember he had a big gun. America. Gun collection, too. It was strange. He had old-time Nazi guns and swords and things. He was a hunter. I recall him going up to Alaska and shooting a bear, and he brought home the bear skin. It was gross. He would often hunt deer, and then throw the dead animal on top of the car. Sometimes that was standard. You always saw in Canada, there's deers on top of the car. He would often hunt, de yeah. Sometimes there would be three or four of them on the hood, the roof. Well, that's America, I never saw that. And then we would drive back. He was so proud, it was ridiculous. Then would take us on these fishing trips up to Canada. That was the last straw. We got fed up with all this hunting and fishing and killing. He would take us fishing for bass in Northern Pike. I hated it. On one occasion, I remember towards the end, I was reading Plato's Republic. I sat in the po boat and refused to fish. I just read this book. It represented a more sane worldview, at least in my opinion and it contrasted greatly with my father and his whole mainstream ideas of reality. Well, this broke the relationship. The father and son bond was falling apart. Third person. There was another incident in high school that further alienated Bruce from the family. At that time, his girlfriend was Italian Catholic, and his parents took exception to this, preferring that he would instead date a Jewish girl. On one particular occasion, he was at her house late at night, and his father came there looking for him, beeping the car horn. 
This created a disturbance which made Bruce angry. Later that night, when Bruce came home, his father verbally insulted the girlfriend, causing Bruce to lose his temper and punch his father square in the face, breaking his nose. <laughs> I never did that. They had to immediately call a doctor. When all was said and done, Bruce was asked to leave the home. The psychological effect of separating from the family was considerable. I underwent psychotherapy for five years, he said. I independently studied psychoanalysis as well, reading all the great proponents, Freud, Jung, Adler, Jaspers, Ellis, and others. It was fun to analyze my thoughts and dreams, my conscious and unconscious, as far as I could. And regarding my therapist, I had someone to talk to, even if only because he was being paid for it. The doctors freely dispense amphetamines to perk me up and thoradine to bliss me out. But as a result, I became only more self-absorbed. My greatest fear was that they would give up on me and send me to an asylum. Luckily, that never happened and I wiggled free. I flew over the cuckoo's nest, as they say. Bruce's mother arranged for him to stay with some friends in New York C City for an indefinite period. Soon after his, this incident, his girlfriend broke up with him as well, and he found himself alone. This was especially difficult during the holiday season when he was used to spending time with family and close friends. Christmas came and then New Year's, but he had no home to go to, no girlfriend, and few people he could turn to. It was a lonely time but one full of reflection and growth. College was now a main concern, and his interests were expanding. Passage to India. Irwin decided to broken, broaden his son's perspective through life experience. Although there was friction in the family, and to some extent hard feelings, family is still family. As Irwin would say, and so he arranged a job for Bruce through the Siemens International Union. This was a closed union that was difficult to penetrate, but Irvin, utilizing contacts secured through wealth and power, knew how to exploit connections. As we shall see, this was all arranged by Krishna. Bruce's tenure on this ship would impact his future and his inclination towards Prabhupada's mission. He reflected on this period of his life. First person. My father got me this job on a ship. I was the officer's mess, working where military personnel socialize, eat, and live for months at a time. Mess basically means common eating arrangement. Prabhupada uses the word also, joint mess. The Bhakti Stanta Saraswati would call temple joint mess that all devotees were interested in is eating, socializing, and sleeping. Uh, the British had that too. I would serve the officers their food, their meals, in the dining room. This was on a tramp steamer. In other words, it didn't have a definite schedule but wherever there was cargo to be picked up and delivered, it would go to those places. It was a freighter, but also a passenger boat, previously owned by one of the Caribbean lines. It had a swimming pool for passengers too. Sometimes it would still go to the Caribbean, mostly for collecting bananas, and people would come and go as well, staying in the passenger quarters. But we traveled all over, really, to all parts of the world. The voyage was amazing. You go through the Mediterranean, then the Suez. In fact, we had to stop in the middle of the Suez Canal. They put little light boats down near our ships, and we could go in the boats through the canal. I remember I went to the canal, and I got out and started walking in the desert. It was this vast nothingness, an amazing experience. You just saw bones in the sand, camels, and huge expanses of heat and emptiness. 
I collected some of the bones and took them with me when I left. Anyway, from this experience, I could understand what it means to sail across the Atlantic in the uh, freighter, which is what Prabhupada did in 1965. A freighter is one-third the size of a passenger liner. We're not talking about the Queen Mary. This is a relatively small ship, and I sailed in August or early September, which is the hurricane month. The hot air from the Sahara Desert blows down, and then it comes to West Africa, to the sea, to the coast, where the air is moist. That's what creates these hurricanes. And then they go across the Mid-Atlantic, and most of them turn up north, with a few of them going westward. And then you have your hurricanes in the Caribbean and America, or at least in Florida. So the ones that go northward, they make the Atlantic bubbly, to put it mildly. The waves in the Atlantic were 30 to 40 feet. It's like a wall of water, a mountain of water coming at you. The ship is up high, and then the ship goes low, and the ferocious mountainous water comes right at you. When the water goes down, the ship goes up. It's like being on a roller coaster. That was more or less when we came across the Atlantic, and that was in February. It was like that. So it was these huge waves. And uh, if after the first day, everyone had to stay underneath. But, yeah, I mean, it was a big ship, but it's going like up and down and up and down. Did it take a month? Like, how long did it take to cross it? Ten days. So one one week or ten days, yeah. But the main point is this. The ship I was on went to India in 1964 during the summer vacation of my sophomore year at college. I believe this was preparing me for Prabhupada's arrival in the West just a year or so later. And it sensitized me so I could appreciate his initial trip to the West which was similar since he was on a, fry, a freighter. Third person. India had a profound effect on Bruce. He loved everything about it. The sights, the sounds, the odors, the food, the aura of Indian culture began to inform his general mode of behavior, affecting his day-to-day -day life. He felt the Holy Land in the core of his being as if he had known it from some prior existence, perhaps a previous life. Now, back in New York, he bought a lungi, sandals, Indian-style clothes, and even traded in his cigarettes for biddies. <laughs> I won't say anything. He, visit, he visited temples, ate at Indian restaurants, went to uh, concerts featuring Indian music and brought books by Tagore, Gandhi, and other India and others. India permeated his consciousness. Okay, this. Last. NYU. This was a time of rapid growth for Bruce. He was now on his own, attending New York University, and he had the ship experience under his belt, particularly his trip to India. Because of this, he considers himself somewhat worldly. He would show slides of India to his friends during his junior year at college, and they would see how the subcontinent and its mystique had taken over his thoughts. At the same time, of course, he found himself on the throes of the era's burgeoning hippiedom. Uh, as was the case for his vast majority of friends as well. It was after all the mid-1960s and diverse worlds famously collided in the village where Bruce would spend his time with hipster acquaintances. Although attending the NYU campus in the Bronx, he would commute to Lower Manhattan to engage his youthful passions. <coughs> His obsession, I'm going to stop here because it will.
it's, it's very small type. Uh, anyway, obviously, after uh, after this sort of introductory part on Brahmananda's life, then uh, comes his meeting with Srila Prabhupada, which, which we're getting uh, on Wednesday, meeting Swamiji. Swamiji. Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. And I forgot to even offer pranams. Namam Mishnupadaya Krishna Krishnaya Bhutale Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamiti Namine Namaste Sarasvati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Sunyavadi Pasarcha Deshatarine Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shiva Shari Gauravakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna.